Hey, deserving listeners, love is blind. Let's watch and see what happens. I did. I and do love you. I, I, w- I want to feel it, and I don't really feel it right now. Today and yesterday, I didn't, I didn't really feel any love from you. Okay, so she is exhibiting that similar all or nothing, black and white, thinking and speaking as she did in that fight that they had after the group party that they had on the beach. And if I were there, which I am sometimes as a couple therapist, I would say, well, uh, it's important. And she, uh, so earlier in this conversation, they were talking pretty well and relaxed, regulated about the same topic. She was basically saying, I, I want you to kiss me more. I want to feel it more. But it wasn't this tone where she seems more extreme in, in her statements. And they ended up talking about how, hey, you haven't kissed me yet today. And he's like, oh, and he goes over and kisses her. And then he's like, well, wait a second. I, I did kiss you this morning. And then I kissed you when I got home. And so that kind of points to what I was observing in that first fight where when she feels hurt, it'll uh, feel as though she's being deprived entirely. And that's what preoccupied individuals will exhibit. And also borderline. It, it doesn't look like borderline, but I can't know. But if we just stick to preoccupation, for those individuals, when they were young, when they were two years old, three years old, their circumstance trained them to actually feel exaggerated feelings because that would motivate their behavior to signal so that people would have to pay attention to them, right? They uh, neurologically couldn't depend on their regular emotional expressions to win the day so that the parents would be attuned. So the, the child will over time be trained. And I mean that, you know, behaviorally rewarded for actually not only feeling bigger feelings, but signaling them you know, 10 times as much. One way to do that is whenever you feel rejected is neurologically to have an inability with nuance and gray zone. It's also a product of just having some arrested development. Children will be this way. If you have a child, a young child, you might not think of it this way, but they're very black and white thinkers. You know, they're, they're either pretty happy or devastated you know they love you love you love you or they hate you (laughs) you know it's time for nap and they don't want to go to nap and you're having a good time and bonding or playing together they're in a good mood they don't want to go down for a nap and and suddenly you're you're the most evil person on the planet (laughs) yeah because for them they haven't been able to integrate those nuances you know it takes development and maturity and experiences and also brain power to retain history in the moment right you know when we are more balanced and mature and differentiated and our partner disappoints us and we're very hurt about it in the moment even without trying we have a sense that what's happening right now isn't the rule it's not happening all the time and when we feel that, uh, you know, that presence of the past, all the times that were positive and caring, or at least not negative, then it will feel very different in the moment. Children haven't developed that yet in general. And when you lack attunement as a young child, or you're abused or something, abandoned, there will not be an opportunity for that maturity to occur. And a lot of personality disorders and more severe attachment injuries will result in this. And you will see that black and white, all or nothing way of thinking, consistent from when it should be around when they're three years old, uh, particularly when they're triggered up until present day as an adult. And so there can be a, a noticing of distance, right? And whether that's real or imagined, it's hard to say. Is he on the cold side. Yeah. But I think with another person who was tolerant or is also like him, I think they would not call him cold at all. I think they might call him quite warm, depending. So there's that. Now, there's also a possibility that behind the scenes, there's something else going on 
where he's more standoffish or, or something. I mean, he, again, he's he's definitely not the most warmest person. Not to say that she can't advocate for a difference, or and she has been. She's like, you know, I, and he seems to be responding. But anyway, so the idea is, is you know, when you're four years old, seven years old, when you signal normally and you feel, you know, like say your parents are just kind of neglecting you or they're kind of not paying attention to your feelings. And the normal response from a child would be to maybe make a little noise with your toys or um, to, you know, mom, mom, um, look what I'm doing or whatever. And that almost never works. So neurologically, the child develops in this way where, and this is all reversible through awareness and emotional regulation and corrective experiences. It's well understood. But and it is a specialty of mine that I have seen for my eyes of that changing in people. But the individual, that the, the child, will be trained to um, one because they're black and white thinkers. So it's it's like I'm I'm being rejected right now, and I am very very rejected, right? And it, they're rewarded for just feeling feelings bigger, and also it helps in order to feel feelings bigger so you you can make sure so you know because the child will start screaming or start grabbing the parents right and this is all observed in the lab and then the parent has to pay attention so what will happen is that you know in addition to what i was saying earlier it can facilitate that emotional response and the reaching out in a severe way if you misinterpret what's happening <laughs> Or if you exaggerate the perception, you know, it's like, I think I'm seeing a little bit of a rejection. And so neurologically, it helps to actually say, not only am I sure I'm being rejected, but I'm being rejected times 10. I feel terrible. And this is an injustice. And I need to demand that I get attention right now. So from the outside, it'll it'll look uh, strange. It'll look clingy. It'll look overreactive. But the child was literally in my model, trained to be that way when, when they were young. And she has a pattern of exhibiting the results of that, that she says, you haven't kissed, you know, because she, she was telling her friends, like, he hasn't even kissed me today, or I think she was saying that. And, you know, she, she's clearly been ruminating on it. And yet he did kiss her a couple times. Now, was he standoffish? It's a work day, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, was he a little distant, a little cold to, to her liking, okay, probably. But w the way that she was interpreting it, you know, she rewrote history in her mind. If you hooked her up to a lie detector test, she would say, yeah, he didn't kiss me at all. Even though it was only just a couple hours earlier that he had kissed her maybe twice. Not to say that that's like a slam dunk indication of a lot of intimacy, you know, it's not, but, um, but you know what I'm saying? I don't know if you can hear my dog. Uh, he's having a dream. <laughs> He's like grunting. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's, let's rewind that. I do love you. I, I, w I want to feel it, and I don't really feel it right now. Right, so it's been kind of escalating. You know, in the beginning, it was, I want a little bit more affection, or I want to kiss, and she's sort of light about it. And also another thing is they both kind of agreed that they've, they've only had one fight. They had the fight that we saw. So we, there, has, there have been no other moments, which is interesting. I, I wondered, particularly after that first fight, I was like, oh boy, this isn't going to go well. Um, so it's a good sign that it's been a while since something like this has, ha has happened. And maybe this is just a transition fight, like she's being triggered by the reality of him going to work and it is concerning or anxiety provoking for her. But if they can sort of get over this hump, sometimes you'll see that. When there's a, a shift in routine, preoccupied individuals will have a particular hard time with it. But if they can see themselves through, even though it, it's a little bumpy, um, she can come through the other side with uh, a trust in, in the love and the relationship. So anyway, and so it's escalating. And now she, you know, she's having that tone. She has that kind of look. Now... If things go as well as they did last time, and they weren't great last time, but if they go as well as they did last time between the two of them, then it, it could um, it, it could work itself out over time. He also said something to the friends that were, was interesting. He uh, he said, "Yeah, you know, I um, we fought, and uh, I apologized, 
and we made up and everything was great. And uh, he said something interesting. He's like, look, um, I, I'll apologize for the rest of my life. I think meaning I don't mind taking responsibility. I don't mind taking the hit <laughs> um, as long as you hear me. That's, that's what he was saying, as long as you hear me. And that is something that I'll hear avoided people will say sometimes, and really just everybody, but um, they, and really, like I said, everybody, they, they want people to uh, let in what they're being told, right? And especially in a situation like this. Like, if I'm telling you that I love you and I want to be with you, then I want you to at least hear it. I don't want you to immediately discount that or rebut it or ignore it. You know, I want to be heard, and that's very important. Uh, the other thing they were talking about was that uh, he said that he was hanging out with Jeremy, I think, and Jeremy in his, <laughs> his ways said, have you seen Jessica? And... Uh, he's like, no, I haven't seen her. And he's like, oh, well, you have to look at her Instagram. So Jeremy pulls out the Instagram and he, you know, Jimmy was saying, wow, she looks like a Kardashian or something like that. And then he came home. And the, so the next time he, he sees Chelsea, he told her and he, you know, he said, I, I just didn't want that to be a secret. In his way, Jimmy isn't very good at reassuring people, <laughs> you know, um, but I think basically he was saying, yeah, I mean, she's, she's pretty. Uh, she looks like a movie star, but I love you and I want to be with you. I, I, I think he might actually uh, be that way. <laughs> I think the major question, you know, my wife, she's frequently wondering about Jimmy if he actually likes her or not. And that is a question, I suppose. But there, there's a chance that he's not that complicated, that he's committed and he likes her, loves her, is attracted to her. And that's it. He's not one of those people that's flaky about that or confused. He's just not particularly good at not putting his foot in his mouth and reassuring people, you know? Anyway, so um, she seemed to handle that okay, the, the thing about Jessica. But I also am now wondering, given that she is at this point, if, like with the AD thing, if the Jessica thing tweaked her and it's like rumbling under the surface and she's sort of holding on and then eventually this has to come out actually that that would make sense right or like i said it's just a transition adjustment to him going to work you know they've been together 24 7 since they met in the pods for the most part particularly once they went on the getaway and so if you are preoccupied you know it's, it's an adjustment Today and yesterday, I didn't, I didn't really feel any love from you. Okay, well, I mean... I'm not gonna be able to tell you I love you every single hour of the day. Just yeah, it, he's kind of in a weird spot because what do you do at that moment? Plus, as I was saying in the first fight, when if he does have love and he has been putting in effort, and he doesn't put in effort. He actually wants to kiss her and stuff. It's not like he's forcing himself to kiss her. And he's just trying to go through his day. And and in his way, he's been a good partner. He hung out with her friends and they had some laughs. And he thinks that he's being a good partner. He's not, in his mind, he might think I'm not being a bad partner. And then she comes up and, and as she is expressing concerns earlier in this conversation you know he's really trying you, you know runs across the table kisses her and he's had been saying i love you i want to be with you i i wouldn't have proposed to you if i didn't want to be with you i want to spend the rest of my life with you and then even though you've done all that and you've said all those things she says i have felt no love from you today or tomorrow if he does love her and what we see on camera is accurate, that'd be a hard thing to hear. It'd be pretty hurtful. It'd be like, well, then it's a lost cause because I do love you. And we've had a lot of great moments today. I don't know. What do you want me to be doing? Just like kissing your feet all day or just wrapped around your finger all? I, what do you, I don't understand. I can't, you know, at some point we have to 
return to regular life. I have to go to work. We have to have conversation. I don't, what do, did I, did I do something bad? You know? So, and you could feel underappreciated, right? If I were a little birdie on our shoulder, I would say, phrase it tentatively just to say, I feel really distant and I don't know why. This is a frequent phrase I recommend y'all say. It's a, a non-accusatory statement. It's a tentative statement. It communicates your concern really more accurately because it probably is more accurate, that statement, than saying, I have felt no love from you, meaning you have shown no love to me. Uh, it's probably more foundational. The observation is, I don't feel love from you or I don't feel a connection. I feel distant. I want to be more exaggeratory about that, but you know, the baseline, that that's what it is. And I don't, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know if I'm just triggered by something, but that's what, it's a much more, it's, it's a much easier to work with if you're Jimmy, instead of just saying blanketly. So, you know, he's like, well, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And when you're being accused kind of of something, it's hard to be sympathetic to that. And it's hard to drum up intimacy to that but I don't know, we'll see how things go because i'm working from home i love you and I, I really want to make things work but honestly i bit the living shit out of my lip and it freaking it hurts to talk you know i i love you to death and i really do <laughs> so he keeps bringing up this you know he bit his lip and it hurts and you know that, that could be true but it's hard to imagine that would be a viable factor i, I think if i'm reading it right I think a better thing he could focus on is, uh, well, in a perfect world, he'd just be able to say, hey, I hear you, and I do love you, and I, I don't know what to, what can I do? You know, just don't get tangential or reactive or defensive. I do care about you, but truthfully, you've been a little clingy. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Not ideal. I mean, even if that's true, I wouldn't use that word. Two, I wouldn't bring this up now. <laughs> so it's accusation and accusation. So he could say, I don't know, but because I think if he were to dig down deep, he, he would say, okay, what I'm hearing you say is that there's a lot of distance that you're feeling from me. And I don't feel that way. Maybe I'm coming across that way. I don't know. But I do love you. And I'm willing to change and I'll try. And I have been trying to open up. I have been trying to be more expressive. And also, I feel like you're not, it feels hurtful when you say stuff like that, because I feel like I have been loving. <laughs> I have been expressing it. And it either isn't landing or you're not paying attention to it or you're not remembering it or something. And it, it hurts my feelings because I, I was expressing myself to you. So I, I don't know what to do or to continue with the clingy sort of angle of, and I don't know, but I'm getting the impression that sometimes you might feel as though I'm going to leave you and you put a lot of effort into holding on to me. And sometimes it, it feels like you're fighting with me for that, but I, I, you don't need to fight because I'm with you. You can trust that. It feels like you're, like you're not hearing me or something, you know, like that kind of language. Just saying clingy is not likely to go well. Clingy? Well, you're saying you want me to give you more love and affection, and I feel like you're giving me too much. Clingy? I felt like- Are you fucking kidding me? You mean you're calling me clingy? That was fucking rude. Like I have told you I love you more than any of the guys have told their fiance. Okay, so now they're escalating. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's you a fact. shit about them. I'm saying I have told you an excessive amount in my opinion. I have told you a lot. Okay. And I have meant it every time I told you. I, okay. I really do love you. That's good. That he can sneak that in. That might help. Let's see what happens. Now, there might be a legitimate 
complaint that, okay, well, you're saying it, but I, I don't feel it. You're not expressing it. So that, that could be, but I don't know. Like I, I know a lot of people like him of various genders. And I think that this could be the way that he loves. And with someone that was also like him, I think they would not feel rejected. They would not feel distanced. They would I guess you could almost consider it kind of like a love language. Um, I don't. I, my point is, is I don't think he's necessarily pathological with the way that he expresses himself. So maybe it's just a style difference. I have given. I know you have given. No, I don't. I don't want to hear from you. I have given a hundred percent to every single person I've ever been with. That's why I chose you. I know you. Okay, that's interesting. I think what she's about to say is, and I never get 100% back. That is the preoccupied mantra because that's the way it feels. And incidentally, it's also the, the borderline mantra. But because uh, what they're going through in patterns is they're very preoccupied and hypervigilant about the closeness and the relationship that's why they call it anxiously attached, preoccupied. They're terrified of rejection, and it's always on their mind, particularly when there's a trigger. But even when there's not, it's just like a constant buzz of anxiety because of their early childhood development. And they do love their partners, of course, but they misinterpret focus and hypervigilance as love. It's not love. <laughs> It's fear. That's what it, they, they love as well. But it's also terror and transference from their childhood. So that's one. Two, they are hypervigilant and, hyper, and uh, also misinterpret and exaggerate indications of abandonment and distance. So whenever there's uh, a, something that could be interpreted as distance, like they're at work and they don't text you back, even though they're working all day and they're busy, then it will be interpreted at the way it feels, which is abandonment. And so at the end of the year, when they tally like, okay, how much attention and love and energy and desire have I put into this relationship? Well, a lot, if not all of myself. How much of, of it have I gotten back um, a lot by proportion, a lot less, even though the other person is being very loving and is there in the regular sort of way. But it, there, it feels a deficit because of how much fear they have is motivating them to be so much more put, you know, put so much more attention and effort. And so you f fast forward uh, through time and that aggravation will get worse and you know, one or both people will eventually break up. The the other person might break up because they just get fed up with the accusations and the fighting and the, the anger and possibly control. So that could happen. But also the preoccupied person could break up because they just implode at cer a certain point and just like, I, I can't do this again. And, and they might actually break up. So you repeat that relationship over and over and almost always they will conclude no one loves people like the way I do. I have so much love to give. And every partner I've had, I have loved completely. And I've never received the commensurate amount of love back. And this is all a reflection of when they were children, by the way, with their caregivers. And it's, a, it's almost a universal statement that you'll hear. You know, similar to like avoidant attached people will say that they don't uh, really need people. They're okay on their own, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there's certain phrases, certain ideas that, that will be common. And I think, that's, I think that's what she's getting at. And I think she's realizing it's happening again. Once again, I'm giving it my all and I'm getting nothing back. For you to say I'm clingy when I'm trying to do things for you to prove to you like- I'm hey, telling you how I feel. I love you. I'm telling you how I feel. Okay, well then that says a lot. If that's I, how you feel. 
I do not ever want to be with someone who says I'm too clean. That's not your whole personality now. I'm saying the last few days. Okay, it's good that he's clarifying. <laughs> I, th I think he'd do well by following in Marshall's footsteps and just say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that word. You know, when he said, you're a project, right? Like a little bit later, Marshall was like, yeah, I, I shouldn't have said. Uh, he said, well, clean, that's not what I mean. But he is softening it. He's, he's saying, I'm not saying it's your whole personality. I just feel like the past few days. I still don't think that's going to land. I think in a perfect world, he'd be able to say, hey, uh, well, well, I guess this would be me. As knowing what I know about humans, I would say, hey, Chelsea, I'm so glad that you love me this much and that you you want more of me. And I, I might need that coaxing because it's hard for me to express myself sometimes. And I want to be that. I, I want to. And I, I'm sorry that you haven't felt that. And I, I, I'll try. Uh, I just hope that you can have some hope in me and, and believe me when I tell you that I love you. And because uh, I, I feel like when things go a little wrong, you will conclude that everything is falling apart or that it, we're doomed or something. And that scares me. I don't want you to think that because, you know, maybe I have been unloving the past couple of days. It doesn't feel that way from my end, but it clearly does to you. I don't want you to feel that way. And I feel like sometimes, you know, if he's, if Jimmy's determined to say something like, I think you're exaggerating this or you have a pattern of that. So I'm trying to word that, you know. So, you know, I, I think there are times when uh, you assume that I am not loving you or something. And it maybe it has to do with my behavior. Maybe it also has to do with the way that you interpret things. I don't know. I'm just really glad that you want to be with me and I want to be with you. So I'm really trying to avoid saying something along the lines of clingy. <laughs> I mean, because it's a good thing, and I think he actually likes it. I think he might even need it because he is kind of on the reserved side, maybe the avoidant side. Those folks often will appreciate pursuers because without that, there won't be anything. And I've gotten that impression that he might actually, so he might even say, I like it that you chase me. I like it that you want to be with me. I might, I kind of need that to pull me out of my shell sometimes. I, I will default to a lonely place, and uh, I'm glad that you do that. I also, well, yeah, I guess I, I don't agree that that's the central premise, that she's clingy, but, which makes me wonder if he's been talking to someone and someone's like, oh my God, clingy, right? Uh, I don't know. It ha you have been a little clingy. <laughs> All right, well, expect a lot less from me now, because that's fucking bullshit. Maybe I should stay at my place tonight because this is not, this is not cool. I love you and I want to be with you and I want a life with you. So normally I'd be thinking, woof, this is the end. But I have seen her go down this road before and pretty quickly come out of it. He helped her come out of it, but she also came out of it to some extent on her own. So it it's alarming in a relationship, but it might be something that, she just does sometimes, you know, like when she was talking with the other, she's like, he knows how to handle me. I'm guessing though, she wouldn't say this is how you handle her. <laughs> I don't know what she means by handle her, but I suspect what she means. I've heard other people that are preoccupied will say that they'll say, whether they know they're preoccupied or not, they'll say like, I get overreactive sometimes and I become very convinced of my position and I need a partner that will work with me and not freak out. At, and even at best know how to like handle me, how to calm me down. And he knows how to do that. And she was saying that I think, and, and in this moment, the clingy is counter. If he just would have stuck with it, <laughs> what he was doing without saying clingy, I think if he just would have uh, weathered the storm, I think it, uh, she would have eventually recovered, but this could throw a wrench at things. You. you didn't kiss me once today. I did. You never tell me you I love me. You twice. Okay. Yeah. So getting back to what I was saying earlier, she could literally believe that to be true. And I've I've been there with clients um, to give a 
a stark example. I was working with a couple and the wife either was preoccupied and or was on the borderline spectrum. And at some point there was a bit of tension in session. I think this is years and years ago, but I think it was between, I can visualize the whole session in my head. It's, it's, it's very fresh because it was a very notable moment. It was like a, a couple month period with this, with this client. And I think maybe I had stepped on a landmine with her and she clammed up, but I didn't read the situation correct, right? I might not have even known that she had that reactivity yet. Anyway, so the session ended and it seemed that there was something unsaid or undone or unresolved between her and me, but I didn't detect it. It happened at the end of the session. So they walk out of my office and they canceled the next appointment. And I probably said what, what I usually say is, oh, okay, well, let me know when you want to reschedule or something. And then, um, you know, in the span of all my other work, a month goes by and I think, oh, that couple never made another appointment. And I thought about it and I thought, oh, there was that session. Oh, I wonder if something happened there. And there was a relationship rupture, as we call it. I had a relationship rupture with her and she didn't want to work with me anymore, which is fine. But I was suspecting, given the scenario, that it was uh, some sort of preoccupied or borderline abandonment uh, syndrome dynamic conflict complex thing that was happening. And since I specialize in that, I have a general approach of relationship repair that has to do with facing it and apologizing for it because it can be very healing to the client. And people like that will frequently blow out of therapy. And unless they find a therapist that knows how to address those ruptures well, um, yeah, they might not ever get the help that they need. So I've become accustomed and uh, practiced in, in my approach. And so I contacted them and said something along the lines of, well, uh, uh, you're free to not make another appointment if you want to, of course, but I'm wondering if you're not making an appointment because of something I said or did in the last session. And if you want, we can have another session and talk about it. I, I'd love to hear what what happened if if I'm right about that. And so they made an appointment, the couple, and then um, I asked about it and the wife said, yeah, the, um, I couldn't believe what you said. She's talking to me. And she says, you called me a piece of shit. I think that was the phrase. I, I said, um, what? <laughs> and I, I didn't laugh, but I, I was astonished. I thought, well, maybe she's just being figurative. And she said, uh, yeah. In that session, you called me a piece of shit. And I thought, let me get this. So literally, I said, you're a piece of shit. That's what you're saying that I said, yes. And the husband says, I don't think Kirk said that. And then she says, no, I heard you say it. So of course, I don't want to work with you because you said that to me. Now, my mind is spinning. Now, I've dealt with things in this camp, but not this stark. You know, usually it's from clients who have this relational trauma, they will say, I can tell that you don't really want to work with me, that kind of thing. It's more debatable. But to say that they heard me say something is a sign of possible schizophrenia or some kind of psychosis, right? that will be a sign of that sort of thing will, where you will hear things that aren't being said even by people, right? And that's why they originally called it borderline was because it's on the borderline of schizophrenia. It, there's delusion, it's, that never happened. Um, we have a recording and they'll be convinced and that's what people with schizophrenia will, um, not in that manifestation always, but um, contrary to evidence, um, reality testing, they will, um, not respond, you know, like if you, if you're not schizophrenic or you're not triggered with your, if you're not borderline, you're not being triggered, then if you remember something and you're adamant about it and someone presents enough evidence countering that, in all likelihood, you'll go, hmm, maybe I remember that wrong. But 
you know, if you're actively delusional of a certain kind, you, you won't respond to that. And if you're borderline and you were triggered, because it felt, it felt to this client that I had said that. that there was some transference and some vibe that was happening where it felt like I thought she was a piece of shit or that I was treating her like a piece of shit. And so her brain literally heard those words or manufactured that memory. And the memory becomes a fact. So we talked a long time about it. The husband, I don't think he said that. She was very sure. I spent um, the, you know, the rest of the session, ru you know, rupture repair. And I said, well, one, it, it, if I did say that, that's awful. <laughs> You're not a piece of shit, um, and uh, you're a good person. I, I like you as a human being, and um, I like working with you. So if I did, that's not my memory, but you never know. I guess I, I could have said that, and I don't remember, or I had a brain fart, and I just randomly said that thing. I don't know. But if, if that happened, that is awful, and I apologize. Now, in my head, I'm like, I know I didn't say it, but you, know, you never know. Plus, it doesn't do any good to just get in a, a fight with someone about that, a power struggle. So, you know, I can allow for the possibility without lying and saying that I did say it, you know. Um, so I might say that she's starting to regulate a little bit more. Um, then I say, uh, you're going to have to trust me on this, that I've never said that to a client. I don't know if I've said that to a human being in my entire life. <laughs> I can't uh, necessarily strongly attest to that, but I, I can strongly attest to having never said that to any client. So it's not that I'm saying I didn't say it to you. I know I've never said that phrase to any client, uh, not even close to that. Two, I've never thought that about a client or you. I've never thought in my head that a client was a piece of shit. That's just not possible for me to think about a client ever. I might get triggered, I might be upset, I might be hurt, I might be even frustrated or angry, but I would never go there in my head. It's just not, it's just not possible for me to do that. And that seemed to help a little bit, but in the end, you know, months later, we would, uh, you know, sort of, we, we continue with couple therapy and we would continue to check in on this issue. And I could only get her to a point where she was only 50% believing me. That tells you how individuals with this condition, I don't know her, but we can use it as a jumping off point, with this condition, whether it's in the borderline conceptualization or a certain kind of preoccupation or even disorganized attachment, that because of the past trauma and abandonment and, and maybe abuse, it's, it's a trauma and it's still with them and you know, in the same way that if you got in a really bad car accident and you almost died and you managed to get behind the wheel again and someone almost cuts you off and you just have a massive spike in distress and you, you your heart is pounding, you have to pull over and you start crying. In that moment, well, let's say that it wasn't even that dangerous. It was just someone that didn't use their blinker or something. You know, we could imagine someone with a simple trauma PTSD that would have that reactivity after get, getting in a, a life-threatening accident. So in that moment, there's a there's a sign of imminent death or a sign of another car crash that's happening. But if they didn't have that trauma in the past, they would have been like, well, that's not a very safe lane change. That, but you know, they, they didn't almost run me off the road, but that was um, not a huge problem, but not great. So... In that scenario, even though it wasn't that big of a deal, it it was in the camp, it was in the direction of the danger. And, you know, this massive spike happens and this uh, very uh, exaggerated response happens. That's a physiological thing. We are capable of that as humans. In the same way, there is a, just repetitive trauma and abandonment and pain and maybe abuse. And then as an adult, uh, you have uh, me as a therapist give a vibe that I'm rejecting the client, that I, I am not with the client, I don't care about the client, or I'm thinking about abandoning the client, and massive spike in distress for her, especially since she had probably already handed over a good amount of trust to me, opened herself up to me, and then 
this happens and there's this massive spike in, in, in distress. And then for her, it it feels like something very terrible is happening. In the same way that that car that wasn't doing anything horrible just without, you know, blinker gets over, even though it's not inherently dangerous, really, it feels very dangerous and the person has to pull over. Well, that's what happens to these individuals. In the same way that the driver might actually say to their friend, you wouldn't believe what this other car did. They just, they almost ran me off the road because that's how it felt, right? And so for these individuals, the feeling and the perception become one, that the perception is overpowered by the feeling and then the brain conforms the memory to the feeling instead of the other way around. And so the client feels rejected, even though it's not actually happening, but you know, because of the trauma, it, any sign of it is, is automatically just, and then it's exaggerated. And then that fuels the response of anger and rejection towards me. And with her, Chelsea, um, you know, there's, it, it, she just once again said, you didn't kiss me today. That's what she believes to be true. Even though five minutes earlier, she had said that. And he's like, oh, and then he runs over kisses. And he's like, well, actually, I did kiss you twice. And she didn't uh, refute that. She's like, oh, <laughs> five minutes later, because she's particularly triggered right now, then she is particularly sure, you know, she's, it, it, she's conforming her memories to the way it feels. And then that makes it worse, right? Because if you believe these extreme things that are rejecting, then you feel worse, right? And it's, it's all part of how we treat this sort of thing. You know, you got to break it all down and help them go step by step and regulate emotions, regulate perceptions, have question marks about things, um, take deep breaths. You know, that's sort of the emotional regulation bit at the beginning. And then, of course, corrective experiences will uh, correct for the past traumas and make it so the reactivity is a lot less naturally anyway. So now, does she have a legit complaint? Sure, you know, there's, we, we're not there. There's absolutely a, a legit complaint about him being distant or not being particularly affectionate or expressive or not being home very often or something, you know, that's fine. But it appears to me that she's being triggered and it's not a choice that she's making to rewrite history that you never kissed me today. Plus, you know, there's a lot of couples where, you know, the hustle and bustle of a work day, you don't necessarily kiss that day. And I'm guessing that even if he had, and he did, <laughs> that it's something more general. And like I said, it could be that it's just that he's going to work. Or it could be that the wedding is getting closer and therefore the paranoia starts to set in. You know, it it's probably something else other than just kissing and just today. And, you know, she's, and she's pretty sure of herself. And then when he says clingy, that could cause her to you know, ruminate on that. It's like, he doesn't want to be with me, so I have to protect myself. It's happening once again. I rolled out of bed late this morning. I went straight to work. And as soon as I get out of work, I come down here and meet your friends. And the first thing out of your mouth is that I'm clingy. Yeah, first thing out of your mouth. And she might literally believe that because it feels that way to her. But we saw that wasn't the first thing out of his mouth. It was the thousandth thing out of his mouth. She can have a problem with that word, but just the, it's like, how do you work with that when you're, I, I wish he could just do what he did before and just be like confused. Like, I, I, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Um, because I do love you. At best, he could say, I, I hear you. I, I, and I, it makes me sad that you think that I don't love you because I do. You know, just, you know, just kind of write it out. Because often, like with the driver who pulls over, it's a storm of distress that is coming and then it goes. And so if you just kind of write it out, then regulation will just naturally occur. You started causing these problems and digging for shit the second you saw Jess's picture. It's not about Jess at all. <laughs> I'm about to marry you. Yeah. So I don't know if that's the central trigger, uh, him looking at Jessica's picture, or if that's just another detail in the 
worries that she has. But I have been wondering if that was a, a lot more distressful to her than she was letting on at first. At first, she was um, more calm about her inquiry about it. And he didn't do a great job <laughs> of reassuring her because I, I just think he's kind of oblivious. Um, or he doesn't really love Chelsea or isn't really attractive to Chelsea. I don't have any strong reason to believe that, but you know, it's possible. I think a lot of people believe that. I watched your fucking show with you and you say I'm too clingy and then went upstairs and I had sex with you? And I'm too clingy? No, this is bullshit. This is fucking bullshit. That's fucking rude. That's so yeah. well, fucking Well, if you're gonna bring up the sex, you're the one that wanted to have sex. Yeah, I also did. Also, maybe wanted a little breather from that too. Oh, ouch. Oh, ouch. Jimmy. <laughs> I'm la I'm not, it's not funny. It's, it's, um, it's rough. Almost so, <laughs> ouch. That's not going to help, Jimmy. Yeah, it, maybe it sounds, maybe it wasn't super overt or intense, but it kind of seems maybe that she wanted reassurance because she felt distance or something. And so she, now maybe she was just really randy, but it's also possible, my dog's shaking, um, that it's also possible that she was looking for a quick way for reassurance, which is fine. You know, there's, there's nothing dysfunctional about that necessarily. And it sounds like he wasn't really in the mood and was willing to go along with it, I suppose, or get in the mood or something. And that's another aspect of the clinginess that he's referring to, that it's like, well, this, this feels like there's some emotional pressure here that I don't have the ability to, or I... I, there would be a consequence if I say I'm not in the mood, can we do it later? I don't know, but he's kind of indicating that right now. Yeah, so in the beginning, I, uh, so when they first had the fight, I was like, uh-oh, that's it. <laughs> but then they recovered. And then when they had the beginning of this fight, I was like, ah, they've done this before. Uh, but I, I did say that uh, with that first fight, I'm like, you know, we have seen this before. And of course, clinically, I've seen this that unless they have help or unless they have some way out of the woods, typically what will happen is the the other person will become more resentful and more critical, maybe even punishing in some way, and it'll just escalate from there. We saw that with Nick and Danielle, that in the beginning, Nick was almost beat for beat what was happening between these two, that Nick was fairly calm in his response to Danielle. Season two, Love is Blind. And each time they got in the fight that we saw on camera, he would get more and more prickly. And then till eventually, I'm remembering now, I think when they were choosing like wedding cakes or something, he would end up starting the fights on camera. And she was the one saying, hey, no, no. Yeah. So it's possible that you know we're seeing the early part of that development. Although I will hold out for the hope, I, you know, I don't know. I just, I, I don't know why, but I, I do. I don't know. I guess I just always hope for love. <laughs> but there is a chance that her reactivity is actually a, a lot less than what at least we saw from Danielle, and that will help. And he's not as exasperated as I remember Nick being. So maybe that'll help too. God, it's just like, like I'm so disrespectful. Like I'm so fucking tired of this shit. Like, God. So if this follows the pattern, then she'll take a breather, which is great. And he'll take a breather, which is great. And then he'll go to her and then he'll apologize and they'll make up. But if this goes the Nick and Danielle route, then this is just building resentment for both. Her, she'll get more worried about, because now she has actual reasons to believe that he might leave her. 
and he's building resentment and confusion and hurt himself. I sure would like to see him express that. It might even help if he went to her and say, hey, I just want to tell you I love you, and it hurts me when you say that uh, I don't kiss you or that you think I, I don't love you because I do. It, it, it hurts my feet. It might help to have contact with those feelings because if it's all just intellectual and um, surface from him, it, it's hard to grab onto that. <clears throat> so I don't know. We'll see what happens. At this point, though, it's not looking good. More like go to Bob Hartman in space. Wow. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that could really trigger her. I mean, because often if she's on that spectrum somewhere, that time alone to just ruminate and build in the worries of abandonment and to actually be physically abandoned, not abandoned, but to be physically left can really, you know, it's one thing to feel like you're not getting love. It's another thing for someone to literally walk out the door. It can, it can be really triggering, not necessarily for her, but it, it can be. Particularly if he leaves without saying goodbye. I mean, that's the way it looks like it's being edited. I don't know. Uh, somehow I don't think he would do that. It breaks my heart to see her suffering. You know, it's, it's real. And he's suffering too, but in all likelihood, she's suffering 10 times more. It, it just breaks my heart. I, I've treated so many clients like her, and I don't know if I'm seeing her even close to being accurate, but either way, I feel bad for her. But if I am seeing her accurately, yeah, the the depths of pain, and you know, I don't know where she is on the spectrum I'm speculating that she might be on, but the syndrome will typically carry with it a very low self-esteem and a working model of self that is worthless and abandonable and unlovable. And you're just constantly looking for evidence that that's not true. And then when there's ev even when there isn't evidence, you're just convinced that there is evidence and then you react and then actually there is abandonment. And it's like, once again, I'm unlovable and I'm a piece of shit and I'm never going to find someone to love me. And, and I've always been abandoned. I've always been neglected. I've always been loving and reaching and, and sometimes getting, but almost never getting because no one will love me. You know, it's not just, oh, he insulted me or, oh, this marriage might not work. It's, it's way deeper than that. And then, again, depending on how severe she's on the spectrum that I'm hypothesizing that she might be on, um, you know, moderate to severe, the individual, because of the mistreatment growing up, they don't have a sense of even who they are, such that when they're left without their defenses, when they're left alone, rejected, and they're suffering emotionally, they, it's weird because it, the way it feels, you, the way you'll hear people describe it is there's an emptiness on the inside or an abyss. They don't, you know, they're flying without a rudder. There's no, um, there's no one at the wheel and they're, they're just falling deeper and deeper. And they feel like not only do they, are they worthless, but they don't even really exist because one of the things that I think happens for children is when you give them enough attunement, they learn that they exist because they're being treated like they exist. But if they don't get enough of that, you know, one way to think about it is that we enter into this world not necessarily knowing that we exist, you know? Uh, and there's all this theory about undifferentiation and, and slowly like, oh, there's you and then there's me and then there's... And, and and a part of that is, um, where am I in this world exactly? How, do I matter? Am I? And it it can be a surreal experience where 
metaphorically, you could feel like I don't really matter to people and thus don't really quote unquote exist. And that can start to bleed into your physical sensations where you literally feel like you don't exist. Like you're ethereal or you're a ghost or you're a figment of your own imagination or something. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to put into words, but at the very least a common phrase is feeling empty. And so that is terrifying. And there's, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nowhere to uh, go for people that have been raised well enough and attuned to well enough that they do have a sense of who they are. They can suffer absolutely as well and be broken up with and be very hurt and cry. But there's something to land on. There, uh, there's something to hold on to of just like, well, I, you know, they don't necessarily explicitly say this, but I know I'm me. And I know that uh, at least I remember thinking that I was a good person and I, I kind of know who I am, you know, it, it, it's kind of unspoken. So it can be particularly distressful. I'm not seeing strong evidence of that because that might look differently, but it could also be felt in this moment and not necessarily show itself. But um, even if you're just mildly down that road, you know, it, it, I'm just saying that if I'm right about my hypothesis about her, her suffering could be very, very intense and very deep and all encompassing and a sort of suffering that if you're not on that spectrum, you might not have ever experienced. I know I haven't. I have a vague memory of when I was very, very young, having a very, very intense emotional experience with my stuffed animals. <laughs> and I won't go into details, but it felt very, very negative. And uh, I can kind of remember that. So I, I feel like I can sort of relate. It, it, it's, a, it's almost like a whole different emotional uh, experience. It, it's it's not like extreme sadness or extreme distress. It's it's like an existential nightmare, really. Anyway, there's a chance that she's really, really suffering, which really breaks my heart. Because even if we say that he did make mistakes, it did look like they could have a secure relationship to me. And for it to actually be there and for either circumstance, it just kind of went down this road or her transference, her issues, uh, exacerbated things. He didn't react well to that. To just to have, you know, to have what she's always deserved, to have it you know, right there and it, for it just to vanish, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking from, from her and fr from my standpoint. Okay, well, let's call it a day for that one. And everyone, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.